Welcome, 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 welcome to today's Wonder Why Lunch and Learn. We have the fabulous Dr. Talia Markajani with us today, and we are going to be talking about cholesterol, all right? But before I introduce Dr. Talia formally, let me just tell you who I am and what you're doing here and why Dr. Talia is coming to talk to us. So my name is Tracy Sider and I am a movement coach specializing in pain relief and body shape change for women over 40, particularly women over 40 who are stuck behind screens and are sick of their stiff, achy bodies. They're done with their stiff, achy bodies and they are ready to get in shape, feel pain-free and age well without the sweat, strain or time suck. Of traditional exercise because that really sucks. And there is another simpler, smarter way that I tell you all about in my Reshape Method program, which Dr. Talia has done. Mm -hmm. Dr. Talia, thank you so much for coming to join us today. Cholesterol is a big subject and it's a big taboo. And there are so many different opinions about that. So welcome. Give me thank you, Tracy. Introduce Thanks yourself again. and tell everyone we're what you're going again. to be talking about today. Yeah. So we Talia and I called this podcast in the background, Eat the Damn Eggs. Eat the damn <laughs> eggs. You. Yeah. So we'll give away the punchline, but that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have to run, now you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is good. So let this be a lesson to everyone. If you if you need help being motivated, get someone to just tell you to show up at a certain time and do a thing. <laughs> that's <laughs> Tracy's motivated me to get this podcast going because this has been a, a subject that's come up a lot in my practice. Let me get the screen share going. And I wanted to do a podcast on it, but I just, other things, other priorities were taking hold. So I think Tracy might've seen my Facebook rant or my Instagram rant on, on cholesterol and, I did. <laughs> and invited me to come and talk about this wonderful brain molecule. That has that has a, a lot of a bad reputation. Yeah. So we've we've called this um, this podcast. We've called it in this lunch and learn how cholesterol, when done right, can be your friend. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we have many yeah. different names. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. When done right, can be your friend. Eat the damn eggs. A brain fuel. So it was a it was a combo between them all. I have. <laughs> yeah. Um, so everyone, I think oh, cholesterol has really gotten a bad rap over the years. Mm-hmm. Right? And is that bad rap warranted? Yeah, exactly. So some questions we're going to talk about are, you know, what is cholesterol? What, what is its role in the body? What happens when your doctor says you have high cholesterol? You know, what other things should you take into consideration? You know, what happens if you're told you need to take a cholesterol medication and what foods, you know, should you be eating? Should you be worrying about cholesterol in your food and, and other topics? And we'll open up to Q&A at the end because I think, uh, so think of your questions and type them in the chat for Tracy to, to organize. <laughs> yeah, if you're watching on LinkedIn or um, in my Facebook group, Moving and Reshaping Club, which recently changed name. Um, I am watching the comments in the chat. So if you have any questions that are relevant to what Talia is talking about, I will hopefully just be able to interrupt you or we'll leave them all till the end. And if you're watching on the replay, just type hashtag replay and tag me or Talia and Talia will get back to you. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. I think try and leave them to the end, but I I kind of like tangent tangents. So we might, (laughs) if one feels really relevant about the slide, feel free to to jump it in, but I think we might, we might cover it, uh, down the line. So hold them to the end type. If you type them in the chat, then you, you won't have to continue to, the, to remember them. All right. So everyone, I'm Dr. Talia Marcajani. I'm a naturopath in Toronto and my practice is all online. So I can see everyone in Ontario virtually through my online platform. And I met Tracy, we were collabing. I did her reshape method and it's been it's been very wonderful, very educational. I still do it. Um, just a quick quick anecdote is I was getting psoas pain, and how I know it was psoas pain is because we learned all about the psoas and the reshape method and its attachments and what it feels like and its purpose. And uh, 
And I think, you know, it's one of the stabilizing muscles. So I think I may have pulled it just from like trying to balance myself on the ice. I didn't fall. So the psoas did its job, but I was feeling this soreness. So I started busting out my reshape method, uh, releases, strengthening exercises. And uh, yeah, it's been a lot better. So is it, let, let this be the second lesson of the day, <laughs> which is, you know, like taking charge of aches and pains and understand, you know, from a functional perspective, understanding what the role of those muscles are and having these tools you can implement right away to get on the right track without, you know, having it lead to more hip pain and compensation and tightness in other areas and things like that. Fantastic. Um, I love that. Thanks for sharing that. Cause I think it's really important for people to know that, when you join the reshape method, you get lifetime access because it is for the rest of your life. It's not an exercise program. And to just be empowered, to have the tools and the knowledge and the understanding to that, that movement is medicine and to just heal yourself instead of thinking, oh, I have to go to someone and get this yeah. treated. Right. So that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. It's a, it's a combo of both. Right. So, but one is mm-hmm. passive. You show up and you get yeah. cracked, but the other is like understanding, you know, what to do about the muscle. And, and what it is that's causing the pain and and what, where it came from and how to fix it so it doesn't lead to something else. So yeah, very valuable lifetime Fantastic. of value. <laughs> There's my sales pitch for you, Tracy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So brain fuel, the truth about cholesterol or why cholesterol is your friend or eat the damn eggs. I'm Talia. I'm a naturopath. And the reason that I started posting up this topic is because I'm seeing, I'm, I'm doing a lot of blood work with people. And throughout the end of 2022, beginning of 2023, I'm seeing a lot of low cholesterol. Low. Let that sink in. And uh, some people are on medication uh, and some people are not. And some people have certain things in their cholesterol panel that are high and that that are getting flagged by their doctor. So let's understand what's going on with cholesterol, what it is and why you should care if it's low as well. So what is cholesterol? (laughs) Cholesterol is a molecule. (laughs) It's a a waxy substance that basically moves fat around the body. So it looks like, I don't know if you wanted, if we want the biochemistry lesson, it's a bunch of carbon rings stuck together and it's neither fat nor water. So know that like oil and water don't mix. And, And so it's kind of more of a waxy thing. And it forms our cell membrane. So it goes, it shuffles around the body to repair our cells. It forms the backbone backbone of our hormones. It regulates things in our brain and our nervous system. So our nervous system has a lot of waxy, fatty components to it. It's used as a antioxidant. And... And why do we hate it? Because it is implicated in a process, a disease process called atherosclerosis. So in this picture here on the right, there's a picture, like a cartoon of atherosclerosis. Um, It's a tongue twister word, which is the formation of plaques in the arteries. So the blood vessels, the big vessels of our body that moves blood. And atherosclerosis becomes a problem because it impedes blood flow. So if you think of like a clogged drain in your house, if you if the drain starts to clog or get some things uh, um, blocking it, you get less flow through the drain, through the pipes. So you have less blood through in the body. This is going to cause circulation issues. It'll cause issues getting nutrients to the body, nutrients to the brain. And the end result of atherosclerosis, the, the big problem is the risk of heart attack or stroke in which the blood vessels of the heart or the brain are occluded and the the heart or brain can no longer get blood. And the end result of that, that we're trying to avoid with heart disease prevention is death. So it's important to think of cholesterol like that, right? We don't care when, when we're thinking, when, you know, your doctor's concerned about high cholesterol, they're concerned about cholesterol implicate in cholesterol's implications in atherosclerosis, how that might lead to a cardiovascular event like heart attack or stroke, and ultimately how that might lead to death, right? Because we know that heart disease is the number one cause of death in Canada. So it's a big And I think if we can add there as well, that heart disease, many people don't know this, heart disease is the leading cause of death for women over 50. Yeah. It's not breast cancer, it's heart disease. Yeah. 
Yeah. Heart disease and cancer is number two, I believe. Yeah. Um, So this is the problem, right? So we want to prevent atherosclerosis, which is a plaque that's formed of immune cells. It's formed of, there's cholesterol at the site of the plaque. So the plaque consists of LDL cholesterol. Um, And then eventually it starts to lead to a block. There's, There's a lot of inflammation at that area. It's important to know how that process begins. So there's a lot of theories. Nobody knows 100% for certain. But the first thing that sets the process off is damage to the blood vessel wall. Then you get cholesterol going to the area. And then you get immune cells and everything starts to clump and coagulate and starts to form a clot. So we're going to talk about is cholesterol the only risk factor for death from heart disease? Okay. That's because we don't Mm -hmm. care. Like your doctor might be looking at your cholesterol panel to see is your cholesterol coming down. But what we care about is the end, the end marker, right? Not the blood marker of cholesterol. We care. Are we getting heart disease prevention? Are we reducing your risk of having a cardiovascular uh, event? All right. So cholesterol does lots of good things in the body, but is involved, implicated, has been accused of causing atherosclerosis. Amazing. Okay. If you're watching on Facebook, give us a thumbs up or a heart in the comments to let us know that you are with us. Yes. Very interesting, right? So there's a bunch of different things. When you, when you get your blood work done, you check your cholesterol. Cholesterol has a bunch of different things going on. There's total cholesterol. Okay. That tells you what is, what is the grand total of all the cholesterol in your blood that we can detect. Okay. And that is usually the main thing that we talk about. We talk about cholesterol. So usually your doctor's looking at that number to see, is it under a certain level? And that number depends on other risk factors. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, And you're going to learn how that number is, I believe, and the research, like the journal, the prestigious journal Nature in a recent study shows that number that we're trying to chase is probably way too low for optimal health, let alone cardiovascular disease prevention. So you have your total cholesterol, then you have triglycerides, HDL, LDL, and something important to consider is the cholesterol to HDL ratio. Okay. So triglycerides are just kind of like fat in the blood, like waxy fat in the, like the triglycerides form uh, the fat molecule. And so we test them as part of a cholesterol panel they are related. So they're important because they're related to the condition of fatty liver disease. Fatty liver is when you are developing visceral and abdominal fat. So everyone talks about the belly. The belly fat's not such a big deal if you can grab it. I mean, we don't love it, but if you can grab your belly fat, you can like (laughs) grab your belly pudge. It's actually, that's subcutaneous fat. It's, we don't love how it looks, but it's actually not harmful to your health. What is harmful to your health is visceral fat. So that's when you can feel that your your abdomen has gotten larger and it almost feels hard. The reason it's hard is because there's more inflammation. Now, this is different from abdominal bloating. So if you've blood, you can get it assessed, right? Because it's hard to tell sometimes. All we usually feel is like, oh, my stomach is bloated. So if you feel it, there's a lot of um, almost like a, a distended belly that's very hard. Um, Sometimes fat in the face can reflect visceral fat, but when we have fat around the viscera and we have fat around the liver, it starts to affect how our metabolism works and it starts to affect our health overall, increases inflammation. It affects our liver health, which we're going to learn is very important for our overall health and our metabolic health and managing cholesterol. So high triglycerides are associated with fatty liver. They're associated with insulin resistance and a condition called metabolic syndrome, which is a precursor uh, syndrome to diabetes, where you have high cholesterol, you have high insulin, high blood sugar, a lot of abdominal fat, high blood pressure. So ideally, you want to keep triglycerides under 1.7. Even better, I would like to see them under 0.8. So the lower, the better. Um, We usually test triglycerides in a fasted state. So it's a good idea to go fasted, even if your doctor doesn't tell you to, avoid eating for about eight hours. Go first thing in the morning before breakfast, drink lots of water. Uh, Don't drink coffee. So this is called the fasted state. And we see what triglyceride levels are when at baseline, because after fat, after consuming a meal 
uh, that's higher in fat, you can get a temporary rise in triglycerides, just like you can get a temporary rise in glucose after eating a meal that has sugar in it or carbohydrates. All right. So we're looking at fasted triglyceride levels. We'd like to see under 0.8. The higher the triglycerides, typically the more insulin resistant someone is, and there's other ways to test insulin resistance, but this is a really cheap way to figure out if insulin resistance might be at play. All right. The next one is HDL cholesterol. What does HDL, HDL stand for? It stands for high density lipoprotein. <laughs> okay. Uh, so cholesterol is packed into these lipoproteins. This is, this is, you, you came for the whole lesson. So here it is. <laughs> so these lipoproteins are, we have a picture of it in the other slide. It's like the round uh, ball that's packed full of cholesterol and fat and triglycerides. So high density lip lipoprotein are typically, um, they're smaller, they have a lot more packed in and HDL's job, if you want the science lesson is to bring cholesterol from the arteries, from the organs to the liver where it can be processed. So how that benefits atherosclerosis is you're taking cholesterol from these plaques and you're moving them out of the plaques. It's cleaning everything up. HDL acts like an antioxidant in the body, has a lot of beneficial health effects, and it's negatively correlated with insulin resistance. So the higher your HDL is in blood, the, the better insulin sensitive you are. So the better your insulin is working. Okay. And we want in, so what we want is insulin sensitivity. What we don't want is insulin resistance. So the higher the HDL, the better. Um, and yeah, it protects against heart disease. It's an antioxidant and it's reflecting good glucose control, good metabolic health. And you want your HDL at least over 1.3. And these units are in millimoles per liter. In the States, we use different units. Um, there's cholesterol conversion charts on the internet I had to use to get them into the units I, I know. So if you're from the States, these might these numbers might look weird. You have to do a conversion if you have different like very strange numbers on your blood test. They're probably using different measurements. All right, the other, so HDL we, we, is sometimes called the good cholesterol. These are the sim, simplified, um, you know, simplistic terms to describe these different cholesterol uh, lipoproteins, but this is like a colloquial way to remember them. HDL is high, it's good. LDL is sometimes uh, termed the bad cholesterol stands for low density lipoprotein. Again, it's just a different type of package that contains cholesterol and that contains triglycerides. All right. So it's all cholesterol. It's just the packaging of it, right? So it's, we're all humans. Some of us drive Mercedes, some of us drive Fiat's, <laughs> some of us bike. <laughs> okay. And so sometimes we call, we hear LDL termed the bad cholesterol. This is what statins prevent the synthesis of. So typically what statins will reduce is LDL cholesterol. Um, and statins will also, they'll reduce the total cholesterol. Now in Canada, so we, we will typically just test someone's LDL. Okay. I want to see LDL at about 3.3 millimoles a liter. And I don't want to see it much lower than that. So there is a problem when you start getting very low LDL because LDL we need just like we need all cholesterol for general uh, health benefits. Now, um, LDL sometimes is high as a response to something. We're going to get into this a bit later, but something called endotoxin lipopolysaccharide that's caught, that's released by harmful bacteria in the gut. So lipopolysaccharides associated with inflammation, with depression, the result of intestinal dysbiosis. If you have this state or this condition, your body will make LDL as a way to neutralize the lipotox, the the uh, endotoxin, the lipopolysaccharide. And so, one of this is a classic example of you know blaming the fireman for the fire. Like every time a house is on fire, there's this red truck that always shows up. I bet you it's involved, right? So we have to be really careful when we look at the situation. Like, why are you always here? It's like, well, because I'm the fireman. My job is to put the fire out, right? So we have to be careful with LDL. Are we trying to just suppress LDL? What if it's there to serve a purpose? Uh, and the same, same similar uh, idea in atherosclerosis, right? 
we, we find cholesterol in these arterial plaques that we don't want because they're harm, harmful to our health and they put us at risk of heart disease and stroke. Um, but is the LDL the cause of these plaques? And therefore, if we lower LDL, is that going to solve our problem and prevent heart disease and stroke or not? Or is there another factor we need to be aware of? So there's actually a couple kinds of LDL. There's the regular LDL, and then there's very low density lipoprotein. Okay. So you got high density lipoprotein, good, low density lipoprotein, fine, not really a problem. And then very low density lipoprotein or VLDL and the VLDL and LDL, they get grouped into the same category. Okay. Which is not really fair, but there is a way to, and, and VLDL is more associated with atherosclerosis. So somebody might have high LDL, but it's the, like the light, fluffy, the less dense, um, or sorry, the, the, yeah, the low density. So it's, it's the, it's the less dense LDL. And, um, and that is not harmful. It's not implicated in causing atherosclerosis and heart disease. So how would you tell in, in Canada, we don't routinely test this, but we can test the two markers, ApoB and ApoA1. And so ApoA1 is uh, connected to HDL cholesterol and ApoB is the very low density lipoprotein that we don't want. So if someone has a high ApoB to ApoA1 ratio, they're more at risk for cardiovascular disease. It might be more beneficial to be concerned about high cholesterol. So the, the clinical path might be you have high cholesterol, you have some other factors that we're concerned about. We're worried about your risk of heart disease, stroke. Let's do a further investigation. Let's test ApoB, ApoA1 and see if we need to be concerned about cholesterol or if we need to focus more heavily on these other factors. Now, these two tests together are about 70 bucks. So they're not, whereas the cholesterol panel is like $15. And that's something that your doctor routinely will test. So it's a little bit more costly. I don't tend to order it too much um, because in most cases, unless someone has extremely high LDL and extremely high cholesterol, we're focusing on these other things that are uh, increasing their risk of heart disease. All right. I hope that makes sense. Now, the final marker, and this more studies are showing that this might be more important for predicting your heart disease risk, is the cholesterol to HDL ratio. So ideally, this number should be under three. And it's I have to say, it's quite rare for me to see somebody with that number under three. So you can either get that number under three by lowering total cholesterol or raising HDL, right? So, and again, because HDL reflects metabolic health, only 12% of humans in North America are metabolically healthy, which means that they their body responds probably to insulin. They regulate glucose optimally. So I'm seeing a lot of elevated cholesterol to HDL ratio. So meaning that somebody's HDL is, they don't have enough HDL to, you know, out of their, the total cholesterol, not enough of that cholesterol is HDL. And this is just done with a calculation. You take your total cholesterol, you divide it by HDL. It's done for you in the labs. They give you the number. Okay, that 12% is pretty shocking. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. That's yeah. for another conversation, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, yeah. And what we're going to talk about that too. That comes up again yeah. in another slide. But the reason it, it often goes undetected because we don't tell people about metabolic dysfunction until it's gotten to the point of diabetes, essentially. Right. Okay. So people are not, it's either not measured very often, not measured and people are often not alerted to it. Um, you will be told that you have high cholesterol, but you'll be prescribed a statin and then that'll be that. Mm -hmm. Um, now many patients, if they tell their doctors that they want to commit to diet and exercise for three months, they're often given that leeway. So your doctor will support you. They just may not know how to coach you through that. The, they're like diet exercise. So figure out what, what diet, what exercise and have fun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So one thing I, I like to do with patients, especially if they're stressed out about their cholesterol, because when you go to a health professional that you trust and they say your cholesterol is too high and now you're at risk of, of heart disease, uh, people freak out, right? They want to know like, oh my God, like, okay, I need to go on medication. I need to do what you say. And sometimes that is not necessarily beneficial for their health. It's also 
like, you know, as naturopathic doctors, we, we think there's a, a sort of a therapeutic order to things, right? What we're, what we're trying to understand is why is cholesterol, first of all, is cholesterol too high or is new research, new, does new research tell us that that's, it's actually optimal? Second of all, if it is too high, why is your body trying to compensate for something that we should be treating instead of just blaming the fireman for the fire? Yeah. And then third, what is your actual heart disease risk, right? Because heart disease doesn't occur just because you have high cholesterol. In fact, 50 to 75% of people that get heart attacks have normal cholesterol. So it's not, uh, it's not like, you know, okay, your cholesterol is high. Your doctor said, now you need to be concerned. Now you need to worry about having a heart attack. The problem, you know, and this is the problem in generally in conventional medicine is we don't focus a lot on prevention right? This might be considered a, pre- a preventative measure. It is, in fact, being on a stand prevent- is supposed to be preventing heart disease, but we're not really, for many people, right? A heart attack is a very sudden, very shocking, very stressful event, of course. And, it, it, and for many people, it, it seems to kind of come out of nowhere. And I believe that the, the issue, like we were just saying, Tracy, is that a lot of us are metabolically unhealthy. We're not told that, and we we are. We're, it's not tested for, and so we're walking around where we could be optimizing things. You know, we we might want to, we might be willing to, and not the strategies are not necessarily like all encompassing. Like you have to go on keto or do crazy mm-hmm. fasting or become one of these gym rats. Yeah. It's more strategic, right? So if you're yes. if you're more focused, more strategic, you're working with someone who's testing uh, and monitoring certain factors that are relevant. You can shift your health. It's about patterns and movement over time. And you can shift those patterns away from this path to metabolic dysfunction. And, and then you, you have more control and autonomy and Mm -hmm. and, and you're more empowered around your health and prevention. So this is, this is my philosophy, but there is something called the Framingham heart disease calculator. And it's something you can just Google and you can pull up your own numbers and put your own numbers into this. And it'll tell you your 10 year heart disease risk based on what they fa- they factor in. Okay, so these are models that were generated. There's more to it than this, like inflammation levels, insulin resistance, waist circumference, whether you exercise, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, this gives you a little bit of an idea of you know what your chance of having a cardiovascular event in the next 10 years might be, just based on these numbers. And so you can see that they don't care at all about LDL cholesterol, all they care about is total cholesterol and HDL. And so I just put in uh, my my age and then I put in uh, my details. I don't, I haven't tested my cholesterol in a while, but so I just put five, like an average number and 1.3 for like, just like on the cusp of good HDL. And uh, my blood pressure is lower than this. I just put 120, just like on the cusp of normal blood pressure. So kind of just normal cholesterol, normal HDL, normal uh blood pressure and then it, and then so age will be a big factor in reducing your risk you can play with these numbers and see what optimizes your health more uh checking off uh female instead of male reduces your risk by a lot <laughs> which you'll be happy to hear i mean it is the number one um you know health condition that women will uh you know that women will experience but you, you have a less of a chance of having a heart attack if you're a female because estrogen has protective effects. Um, if you're a smoker, that raises your chances of uh, cardiovascular disease risk by a lot. I don't have the active calculator in front of us because we could play with these numbers just to get a sense, but you see the number go up by a significant amount if you smoke. Um if you're on blood pressure medication, but it's controlling your blood pressure, it, it increases your risk a little bit, even if your blood pressure is controlled. Um, and then you can just see like what, so if I lower my cholesterol from seven to five, what happens to my risk? And you see a very marginal shift. So it gives you a sense, right? When you're, when you're wondering, should I go on the stat and what should I do? It helps you make a decision. You can consider your risk factors. You can get some numbers and you can see, you know, what would what would the best case scenario uh, do, or what what else could I do? Could I raise my HDL? Could I quit smoking? Uh, could I get younger? <laughs> could I lower my blood pressure? All right. Can you see the whole slide? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. We talked about, we're going to talk more about the good, the goodness of cholesterol, but cholesterol is 
we actually, so we hear a lot about how like high cholesterol diet and don't eat eggs because they have cholesterol. Very little, it's interesting to know that very little dietary cholesterol is actually absorbed, if any. Okay. So it's, it's highly irrelevant what you, how much cholesterol you actually consume. There's actually uh, benefits to eating some of these high cholesterol foods that support cholesterol pathways in synthesizing and clearing and moving cholesterol properly through the body and supporting the liver. But you're actually not going to get a lot of cholesterol from foods that are, that tend to have high cholesterol. So that's interesting to know. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. That's big. <laughs> yeah. So everyone remember, so yeah, eating eggs, not going to raise your cholesterol, no, eating any cholesterol, uh, like foods that have high cholesterol, um, it's not going to affect your cholesterol. Your liver synthesizes virtually all of the cholesterol that you need in your body. All right. So now different types of fats that you eat will shift your cholesterol profile. And again, your diet can affect how metabolically healthy you are, and that's going to have an impact on your cholesterol, on your liver, on your visceral fat and your meta, your overall metabolism. So that is important. Uh, certain nutrients that you consume are important, but your liver is making your cholesterol. So if, so people that went on like back in the fifties, when they went on low cholesterol diets, their liver just ramped up synthesis and their cholesterol levels stay the same. So there's virtually zero benefit to caring about dietary cholesterol and trying to reduce it. And if anything, all it's doing is depriving you of foods that are helpful for optimal metabolic function. Okay. Right. So there's a study by, in nature. Um, nature is a, like one of the, it's the, the, where they publish the, the discovery of DNA double helix. So it's like one of the most prestigious medical journals that, that there is. And they published a study in 2019 and it looked at 12.8 million adults. And it looked at like, what is the most optimal cholesterol for humans that prevents all cause mortality? So remember that we were like, okay, we don't like, we were worried about cholesterol for atherosclerosis. We were worried about atherosclerosis because we were worried about heart disease and stroke. We we're worried about heart disease and stroke because we we're worried about dying. So why don't we just study cholesterol dying, right? <laughs> Let's just get right to the dying. That's the most important end point that we actually care about. I guess for the purposes of study, I mean, I care about like, are you functioning optimally and, and happy and thriving? But let's look at actual like all cause mortality. So all cause mortality is it just looks at like death. Like what are your chances of dying from anything? Not just heart disease, because if we only look at people that die from heart disease, we may miss people that die by suicide or that get into accidents and other things that might not seem related to your cholesterol, but might be because we don't fully under, we may not fully understand the whole picture. So it is kind of the best endpoint to study, right? Like what's the best cholesterol to prevent you from dying from literally anything, a piano falling on your head, anything. And so what they found was it's a U-shaped curve. So when your cholesterol is very, and it goes the, it goes, it's a, with uneven U's. So I guess it's kind of like a ladle, or like a big dipper. So the highest all-cause mortality is at the, is at the part of the graph that has the lowest cholesterol. Okay. So you have the worst chance of, the most chance of dying if your cholesterol is like zero, then your chance of dying, <laughs> sorry that it's so morbid, <laughs> morbid Wednesday, uh, your chance of dying decreases. So the bottom of the U, there's like a sort of like a, it bottoms out. So there's sort of like an optimal range where your chance of dying from any cause is the lowest. And there's a certain level of cholesterol at which we find that your all-cause mortality is the lowest. And then as cholesterol levels start to increase, your all-cause mortality starts to increase a little bit, but it never gets as high as when it's low. Wow. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. And then even you. Yes. So the optimal level. J? Yeah. Like a, like a woo yeah. J. <laughs> you know, like a, <laughs> like kind of a, a U with like one end a lot higher. Okay. So the optimal levels, and I have the US units, are so in, in Canada, 5.4 to 6.4 which is kind of wild because that is routinely flagged as too high in my patients. Okay. So if you think of a, a total cholesterol, so TC means total cholesterol, total cholesterol of 6.4 is often wildly higher than your doctor is going to want it. So this is an example of how 
current, re- this is a big study, 12.8 million people. So they, they've taken up a, a lot of data, right? And it's the endpoints all cause mortality. So they're just letting other, other factors that could be contributing to this, that like, do people with this level of cholesterol just like, you know, do they make more money? Do they have better shelter, like better life situation and things like that? Um, it's possible, right? Like these are not perfect studies because we don't control their epidemiological studies. So it just looks at like huge populations and measures their cholesterol and measures other factors. They're not perfect, but they're so big that they give us very compelling information. And so the, the conclusion by these authors was, are our targets set too low, right? Like, are we chasing really low levels that are, they're actually not optimal for preventing death. And so preventing death or like the, the, the lowest all cause mortality, like prolonging life as long as possible. I guess you could look at it that way. So optimal levels is 5.4 to 6.4 millimoles per liter, much higher. I guarantee than your doctor will want it. If you have blood work in front of you, always obtain a copy of your blood work. Everyone always ask your doctor for a copy. So you can have it on your records. You can reference your numbers, but if you have a copy of your blood work, Look at your uh, total cholesterol find is usually on page two or three of blood work and, uh, and see what your number is. And, uh, so you want to be, yeah, 5.4, 6.4 was associated with the lowest all cause mortality in all adults. And then they had different cohorts. So men age 18 to 34, young men, it was a little bit lower and women, it was even lower than that. Women age 13, 18 to 34. So these are younger women, teenagers, um, early 20s, early 30s. And then 35 to 44, it was slightly lower too, 4.6 to 5.6. But still, uh, like, I mean, 5.6, you're often going to get. So the Canadian targets, they want total under 5.2 if you have no other risk factors. So you can already see that's lower than optimal for the majority of humans. They found generally that uh, if cholesterol was 5.1, under 5.1, they had, uh, there was a stronger association. So once your cholesterol started going under 5.1, there was a stronger uh, probability that the lower it got, the more your risk factor for all-cause mortality increased, all right? Versus like if it started to get really high, like eight or nine, the increase in risk of all cause mortality wasn't as strong. Okay. <laughs> I should have just shown the graph. Okay. So, so the conclusion okay. is the ideal is somewhere between 4.1 to 6.4, depending on your age and lower cholesterol is more of a risk factor for all cause mortality. So this is like the ultimate mm-hmm. endpoint for any scientific study, uh, than, uh, um, than high cholesterol. Right. Okay. Now, so why? Why does cholesterol, uh, when it's too low, what is the problem? Like what is happening? So there's a huge connection to mental health and cholesterol. And this is why I see it so often in my practice, why I flag it so often. Because there's a certain um, like symptom picture in people with that have low cholesterol that I see, I'll explain kind of the, the vibe uh, of the patient. So they have, they, they typically have pre- like low executive functioning. So executive functioning are your ability to find words, initiate tasks, gather momentum in, in completing a task, finish the task. So you're making a sandwich, you you have food in your fridge because you went grocery shopping because you remembered to replenish your fridge. You get the bread out, you put the plate out, you make the sandwich, you put things away, you eat your sandwich, you put it away. So like all of these different components to initiating, completing a task in order to achieve a goal. Okay. So executive functioning is essentially what we're doing all the time. We are maxed out with our executive functioning in, in modern society. So people that are experiencing executive dysfunction, this is very common in people with ADHD, it, they tend to have a lot of procrastination, a, like a lot of difficulty focusing, concentrating. They they tend to feel like things are kind of chaotic. They feel overwhelmed. They like things are messy. It's like the the um, the artist, right? It's like everything is kind of <laughs> just up in the air, right? It's just like the co- kitchen cupboard doors are open, sinks full of food. So so executive uh, functioning is like 
um, like, okay, so the, the best example of this, if you've ever seen the movie Limitless, is, uh, so has anyone ever seen this movie? You can put it in the chat if you have. It's about, it's Bradley Cooper. He takes this medication that allows him to use 100% of his brain. And it shows him before, and he's kind of like, his apartment's a giant mess. His girlfriend thinks he's a loser. He's just like, he's trying to finish his book, but he's like procrastinating. He's totally ineffective. Like everything's a mess. Then he takes this medication. The first thing he does is he cleans his apartment. (laughs) He helps his neighbor write her dissertation. He finishes his book in the afternoon. And and then that's like executive functioning. Right. So basically the whole book is about like good brain fun or the whole movie is about good brain function. So the patient will have like kind of low executive function, low mood. It's kind of like a very like sluggish, like kind of foggy brain. They have difficulty finding words. They feel depressed. They may feel like irritable and aggressive. Um, This occurs a lot. Uh, They may, you know, experience sort of hormonal irregulation, like PMDD type symptoms. So some studies show that cholesterol under 5.2 millimoles a liter is associated. And so this is a little bit lower than that all cause mortality optimal range. Um, but when it starts to go under 5.2, it's associated with poor performance on cognitive measures like verbal fluency, attention, concentration, abstract reasoning. So people's cognitive abilities start to decline when their total cholesterol starts to drop. It's a very bad thing. So mm. this is, you know, when I see people, this is why guys, I made these Instagram posts because when people will come in and they're like, my doctor says my cholesterol is too high. I'm on a statin. I'm taking care of my health and preventing heart disease. I'm like, you are starving your brain. Okay. So this is like the whole thing of like empowerment, staying up to date with the research, right? Like one of the criticisms of our, uh, of the medical system, like practice in general is that we're often very far behind current research. It takes a long time for a study like nature to publish a huge study for like the, your, your GP in a, in a standard practice with their 10,000 patients or whoever to catch up to the research. Cause it takes a lot to, it's like a tidal wave, right? It's like, you've got these medical guidelines, you've got the government regulations, you've got these conferences that you go to, and it's like a, a wave that pushes you along and then it's like, hey, we got a new study and it takes a while to kind of slow the train, educate everyone and change our practice methods. So that's a, like a benefit, at least to being an ND, that we are have a little bit more of like a free floating <laughs> autonomy and you start from the patient up, you know. Um, and so it's, you know, a lo- you, you really, I think, in this day and age have to be an advocate for yourself when you're a patient. You have to, you know learn research don't just believe me you know you can i can find these uh, references for you um yeah so when when cholesterol levels started to go under 5.2 uh then people started to decline their cognitive performance and this is because 60% of our brain's dry mass so if you just take your brain and dehydrate it <laughs> which you should not do, but if you did that in the lab. <laughs> don't try that at home. <laughs> yeah, don't try it at home. Don't put your brain in a dehydrator. Um, 60% of it would be cholesterol. So cholesterol Whoa. is forming your brain. So when you're mm-hmm. preventing, so what a statin does is prevents your body from being able to synthesize cholesterol. And so now your brain is just like, has no way to reproduce itself, to maintain itself, mm-hmm. to repair mm-hmm. things. A quarter of the cholesterol in the body is located in the central nervous system. So that's your brain, your nerves, your spinal cord. Um, And this is, you know, regulating impulses to and from the body. It's allowing me to wiggle my fingers, talk to you, take in information, see things, eyes. Um, Now, you might have heard of the condition multiple sclerosis and you might be vaguely aware of the symptoms, right? That people have difficulty. Uh, They have like, you know, usually a lot of uh, cognitive decline. They have a lot of motor impairment. And the reason, so what's happening in MS is that the myelin of the nerves is being broken down by the immune system. So the myelin is like the coating on your nervous system. We cell membranes. So your nervous system is an electrical system. Its job is to send electricity. Like we're electric. We we send electricity via sodium and potassium through our nervous system. So if you think of like, you know, the electrical wiring, there's a lot of like house analogies in biology and in, in physiology. 
You know, so if you think of like the electrical wiring in your house, you've got these wires, these copper wires that are insulated by rubber, right? Or whatever it is mm-hmm. now, plastic or and you need that rubber. If you if you if rats get inside your house and they start chewing on the wires, you start to get short circuiting. Thing you don't have these impulses. You need the you need the membrane, you need the rubber. And in, in our body's case, it's myelin, it's it, which is formed by cholesterol and these other phospholipids. <laughs> Uh, they in, improve nerve impulses. So somebody who doesn't have enough cell membranes, they usually describe this raw anxiety. My friend will always say it. She's like, my nerves are raw. I feel like a baby with no skin. She's mm-hmm. like, I just feel, I feel jittery. I feel like bottom up anxiety. Like, like I just feel, yeah, twitchy. I feel twitchy. I feel jumpy. I feel like, and we often will say, you know, eat more fat. Fat is supports the nervous system. It helps kind of coat your nerves. And you really can like, you can kind of anthropomorphize your own symptoms, but you feel that you're like, oh, I feel a lot more here, calm, like able to think, like have a, a flowing thought that has a beginning, middle end, as opposed to like that skittery, jumpy, um, dysregulated feeling. Uh, we also need the cell membranes to keep contents in our cells. So our cells are are covered in a cell membrane. A cell is like a ball that's full of all the things that we need to function. And then you just multiply those cells by like trillions and you have a human body. And so it, it matters the coating of those cells. Um, if our cell membranes are too fluid, you get cells that break apart, stuff falls out. If our cell membranes are too rigid, you don't get proper signaling. You don't get things entering and leaving the cell properly. Cholesterol is helping. It's part of the cell membrane. It helps to maintain fluidity and strength of cell membranes. So that's kind of a good analogy for cholesterol, right? If you think of your nervous system and your mood, right? I am, I am fluid and strong. I'm flexible, but I am solid. Mm -hmm. So I'm neither anxious nor depressed, right? I'm, I'm here. I'm focused. Um, and then cholesterol also plays a role in neuronal signaling. So make sure that the neurons are talking to each other properly, your brain cells and neurotransmitter signaling. So it's involved in opioids, our own feel good chemicals, our endogenous opioids it's involved in dopamine, serotonin, um, the stress chemicals. So it's making sure that everything is organized properly in your brain. Uh, low cholesterol alters the production of serotonin. So it impairs serotonin production and the availability of serotonin in the brain. And so there, there was a study in the nineties that showed that people with low cholesterol were prone to, they were more at risk of dying from suicide and usually, so uh, trigger warning um, and usually violent suicide and then they they start to see this association with low cholesterol and aggression and violence. And this has been replicated in primates. And this starts to manifest itself when total cholesterol is under four. And then again, like I said, when I, I see so many people whose total is under four, usually it doesn't get that low unless you're on a statin. But this is a it's a concern because I don't know if doctors are aware that there is a lower limit to what you should be pushing someone's cholesterol. Um, So under four millimeters or millimoles per liter, you start to see depression, suicide, addiction, relapse, executive dysfunction, cognitive decline, and Alzheimer's. And so more optimal is over 5.2. And then you saw that like 5.4 to uh, uh, 5.5, 6.4 range. Again, much higher than you typically will hear the target. So it's always a good idea to like, when your doctor's like, your cholesterol is high. It's like, okay, can I, that's fantastic. Can I grab a copy of my blood work? And then just like take those numbers. And if you need to convert the units, do that on the internet. And then you can write them down. And then you can, uh, so you can compare them to these numbers and you can do, do your own research. I know that's become a meme, do your own research, but I stand by it. <laughs> Do your research and, and then go to someone for guidance that can help you sort through it. All right. So cholesterol and your hormones. So you need cholesterol to make hormones. Cholesterol is what your hormones are made of. And I gave you the pathway. <laughs> so here you go. Yes. You see cholesterol's at the top 
And then it goes pregnenolone, progesterone. How many of you have heard about how great progesterone is? And then you, you also need to make cortisol at the end. Aldosterone is an adrenal hormone for regulating your sodium potassium levels, testosterone, and your estrogen, estradiol, estriol, estrone. These are all uh, forms, the, the three estrogens. Okay. So when we're always like optimizing progesterone, optimizing estrogen, and let's take bioidentical hormones and how do I get my hormones working? Well, this is, uh, it's like, how do I, uh, build a house? I start with a load of bricks, right? So, so you're starting with cholesterol. And so one of the things your body's making cholesterol for, in addition to cell membranes, brain function, nervous system function, antioxidant function, managing endotoxins from your gut, it's making it for hormones. So I have seen, uh, some vegan, I'm not going to single, I'm sort of single you out, but some, some vegan vegetarian patients who have low cholesterol, usually teenage girls that have issues with their periods. So they usually have a lot of mood disorder and they have, um, um, and they have, uh, yeah, like often low hormones, like, you know, regular periods, amenorrhea. And, Again, like I said, you you can't absorb cholesterol from your diet, but there are certain foods, they're mostly animal foods, that support the synthesis of cholesterol and you need saturated fat. Saturated fats from the right sources and, and other fats are important for cholesterol synthesis. So, What would examples of those sources be? So like eggs, red meat, <laughs> all, but also fish omega-3s are helpful for like shifting your cholesterol panel. We'll talk about this, but like, Mm -hmm. you know, if your cholesterol panel is like a suboptimal, like you have low HDL, higher Mm -hmm. LDL, your cholesterol HDL ratio is a little bit off. Like we're looking at the the overall pattern. Fish oil omega-3s can help shift. They can reduce triglycerides. They can slightly raise HDL and lower LDL. Uh, So um, MUFAs, monounsaturated fatty acids from olive oil can help raise HDL and lower LDL Mm -hmm. and saturated fats will raise HDL and LDL. So like coconut oil, it'll raise HDL and LDL. So it'll raise HDL in almost everyone. And it will raise LDL in some people. And so if, so so some people have just like a genetic predisposition to have an increase in LDL in in response to saturated fat. So it might be worth it for those individuals who are concerned to do the ApoB, ApoA1 ratio. I know it's a $70 test, but if you want peace of mind, um, but then we'll also help you with other factors to, to look at. If, and if I think that it. this, this chart that you're showing us is really, really important for women over 40. Yeah. Which puts us in the peri and post menopause category that, um, you know, we complaining <laughs> about yeah. testosterone, estrogen levels, progesterone, and this whole concept of cholesterol as the precursor hormone to all of that is something that I see overlooked a lot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, it's not like just more cholesterol can now sometimes the opposite happens. So during perimenopause, some women can get an increase in cholesterol, right? right? So there's almost this like feedback of the body's like, okay, we have this backlog now of the precursor. So that's a possibility, but what's, what's happening, a, a significant thing that's happening in perimenopause and menopause is that we're, as we lose progesterone and estrogen, we become more insulin resistant. And if someone already has a pattern of insulin resistance, it never usually comes out of nowhere. There's a pattern of insulin resistance yeah. being under muscled. And we often will start to see that really rear its head. So people start to get more abdominal weight gain, they start to feel more fatigue, more craving sugar, you know, gaining weight, um, and noticing that body shape change that all of a sudden like reveals itself really quickly. Right. So it's really important to, yeah, look at that because we often think it's like, it's my hormones, but it's, it's usually an underlying thing. That's, that's the hormones we're protecting you from in some right. way. And, and then uh, am I correct to say that you're also not, you're also saying that that increase in cholesterol, which people often start to see in late perimenopause and menopause, you're saying that's not the fault of the eggs. Like, don't blame. No, them. yeah, it's not. Yes. No, 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 no. Yeah, like, well, because you're not even absorbing the cholesterol from the eggs in a significant manner. It's not your. It's not eating fat. Yeah, you're not. You're not going to get 
like a massive spike in LDL from dietary fat. It's just, just people can't eat that much fat. Now though, what raises triglycerides? Fructose. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and we do care about triglycerides because triglycerides, like we said, associated with insulin resistance, associated with abdominal, yes. visceral fat, fatty liver, uh, more inflammatory. So high fructose diets will tend to raise triglycerides. Fructose from fruit, not so much. I'm, t- I'm thinking like high fructose corn syrup, table sugar is a glucose and a fructose stuck together. So you're getting fructose tastes sweet. So sweet taste. You could think of it like that. And mm-hmm. fruit is, fruit does have fructose, but it's more protective because it, it, there's more water, there's more vitamins, there's more fiber. And I would recommend people not consume fruit alone as a snack, like consume it maybe after a meal for dessert or consume it as like with nuts and things that are going to, that are going to put some clothes on your carbs. This glucose goddess on Instagram, she talks about that. She's like, mm-hmm. put clothes Love on that. your carbs. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So low cholesterol. So we also need it for uh, vitamin D and it's not here, but uh, actually maybe it is. Oh yeah. DHEAS. So that's the dehydroepiandrosterone, <laughs> uh, which is a very important molecule that helps protect you from stress. And this is a, it's uh, it, and it starts to, it makes your estrogen for you after menopause. So your estrogen goes to your um, DHEAS gets converted to estrogen. So optimizing DHS is really important. Um, and there's an inverse relationship between cortisol and DHS. So the more cortisol you have, the lower your DHS and vice versa. So this is the stress, another relationship with the stress, uh, you know, perimenopause symptom connection. Uh, vitamin D is a steroid hormone. So is vitamin A, and they all are synthesized from cholesterol. Your body makes vitamin D from cholesterol molecules on your skin when sunlight, sorry, hits cholesterol molecules on your skin. So when you have, if you have low cholesterol and there's not enough to sit on your skin to make vitamin D, even you can get all the sunlight you want, you might not be synthesizing D. Um, And, you know, we know, and you probably have heard, especially throughout the COVID years, that vitamin D supports the immune system, reduces autoimmunity, supports mood, important for bone health, and so on and so on, hormonal function. And we see a, an association with low cholesterol and increased risk of cancer, hemorrhagic stroke. So there's two types of stroke. There's um, atherosclerotic, ischemic, oh my God. <laughs> and then there's hemorrhagic. So one is a blockage of an artery to the brain. Another is bleeding in the brain. So my grandfather, but oftentimes it's like, oh, it's a stroke. So my grandfather uh, had a stroke a couple of years ago, accompanied him to the stroke clinic at Toronto Western. And, um, it was a hemorrhagic stroke because a do- when he moved from Ottawa to Toronto, the doctor he saw doubled his statin dose on him. And so ended up with a hemorrhagic stroke and, uh, yeah, so he's, he's good. He's recovering, but he, like, yeah, there's, you know, sometimes after that, there's, there's a section of the brain that doesn't recover. Um, it's associated with depression and anxiety, low cholesterol, as we talked about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a depressing talk. Sorry, guys. Hopefully it'll start to become empowering. <laughs> uh, metabolic syndrome. Okay. So we talk a lot about this, right? Metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance. What is your metabolism? It's how your body takes energy and uses it. That's like a, the best way to think of metabolism. How do you break? St- how do you uh, uh, like think of your bank account you, in your bank account at any given time? There's stuff going in, there's stuff coming out. So how much is are you storing in your savings? How much are you spending with your checking? What's in your credit card? What's in all these different accounts? And how is your general state of abundance in your life? How does that manifest as your state, right? If you have more money, you could buy a Ferrari or you could pay for a bus pass or whatever you want, right? If your money is somehow locked in a long-term savings account, you could be a billionaire, but you can't access that money. And so you could be functionally poor or you could be spending like crazy and really have nothing and be like, you know, kind of in debt, I guess. I know our body doesn't really go into debt, but um, so metabolic syndrome is a an issue with the spending and savings. A lot is going into savings you're not able to access that savings to spend money. And so for your body, that looks like everything your body does, your immune (laughs) system, your mood, your muscle mass, being able to tap into body fat to 
to use for energy. That's what fat is for. Um, our digestive function, like physical, mental energy. So when people say like, I don't have energy, there's a bunch of different kinds of energy. We usually are saying that we don't, that we feel sleepy or that we feel physically tired, but, uh, but there's also the lack of motivation. Like all of that is energy. So metabolic syndrome is there's this connection between high, so dyslipidemia. So this is the like high LDL, low HDL, high triglycerides, the cholesterol panels like out of whack, you got a low cholesterol HDL ratio. You'd probably have a high APO B, uh, APO A1 ratio. Your blood pressure is high. Um, 120 over 80 is like a good standard blood pressure, but there's different targets depending on whether you're on medication or not. Um, so yeah, there's usually hypertension, there's abdominal visceral fat. Like I said, the way you can tell is you can't grab this fat. So you can't pinch it, the pinch an inch thing. And often visceral fat is, is associated with a facial fat, which is very interesting. Like I learned that recently. I think that's recent research. So people that um, are noticing like, oh, I'm noticing like my face is getting thinner. It's actually a good indication you're losing some of that problematic visceral fat. Um, now, when you have visceral fat, that's where all your organs are. It's where your liver is. Liver is in charge of regulating our metabolism. It's like the big orchestrator of our metabolism of digestion. And so fat starts to accumulate on the liver. The liver starts to become more inflamed. It stops being able to function optimally um, with metabolic syndrome. You end up with a high fasting insulin. It might be normal in your blood range. The blood range is very high and it's rarely tested. So you have to ask for the test. Um, and you have to obtain the results and then it, you should, you can run your fasting insulin, your fasting glucose through a calculator that will tell you your level of insulin resistance. Okay. Now, sometimes you might have elevated fasting glucose, but very often people don't. I just saw a patient who had very normal fasting glucose, but had very high fasting insulin. It was still in range. It was quite high. She had extremely high insulin resistance. She had uh, symptoms of, so she had very high triglycerides, low HDL, and uh, actually started to see, we started to see some elevated liver enzymes indicating that her liver was inflamed and struggling at this point. So this, like if you think of the continuum of events, she's already moved quite far along, but her fasting glucose, if that's all you're looking at, she looks totally healthy. Uh, wow. And so that this is the, um, you know, when people are like, oh, uh, my doctor says I'm healthy. I looked at my blood and I'm healthy. I'm like, and I'm not, you know, uh, that's great if you're healthy, but it, it it's, let's actually be certain of it by doing proper testing and, and looking at things and, and optimizing how you feel. And then not, you know, wait 20 years and like, oh yeah, okay. Now you're diabetic. Where did that come from? Oh, it's genetic, you know? So you don't necessarily have to have fasting uh, glucose. Your glucose could be totally normal, but once glucose starts to become elevated, it's showing again, that things are moving in that direction. Um, and like you're, you're basically, your insulin is no longer able to compensate and manage the glucose and keep it down. Um, so yeah, you want to get fasting insulin tested. You want to do your fasting glucose. Fasting means eight hours without food, just water. And, uh, and then you plug, you can plug those numbers into the HOMA IR calculator. You can Google that. You can find that on the internet for free. You put those numbers in, you got to change the units. <laughs> It'll tell you how to do it. And then you can see what your number is. And you want that number to be under 1.9. And so, you know, 88% of people either using the HOMA, HOMA IR or a glucose tolerance test where you drink a giant glug of glucose. It tastes absolutely horrific. 75 grams of glucose. So at first you test your fasting insulin, your fasting glucose, then you drink the glucose drink, and then you go back two hours later and you see how does your body respond and deal with that glucose load. And uh, so if someone has impaired glucose metabolism, they have really high postprandial after eating glucose and really wildly high insulin. And then what usually happens then is that your blood sugar tanks and that you feel like absolute garbage. And uh, then you're really cra craving sugar and you feel anxious and you feel irritated and your brain can't really function. Uh, but often we don't even notice that, you know. Um, so with metabolic syndrome, the liver is involved. The liver is this like the, kind of the organ that's at the crooks of it all. It's getting affected by this. And it's also, uh, it's it, it's like a vicious cycle. Like when the liver is affected by this, it 
has a difficult time making cholesterol properly, processing the cholesterol, uh, regulating blood glucose. And so you'll see like elevated triglycerides, low HDL, you might find um, elevated liver enzymes. So in pretty standard blood work, your doctor might test one or all of the liver enzymes. And these are uh, molecules that your liver produces when it's under distress. So examples are are like alkaline phosphatase, uh, gamma glutamyl transferase, (laughs) and we have like short names from ALP, ALT, um, GGT, AST. And, you know, your liver is really important for processing, not just, you know, not just, you know, regulating your blood sugar and making cholesterol, but also it's your, it's the filter. It's the Brita filter of the body. That's where all the toxins from our environment are passing through. Uh, That's where the hormones are passing through. So we can clear them when we don't need them anymore. Um, And how that might be relevant is that if you're, it's it's kind of like, um, taking out the garbage. So you order takeout, you eat the food. Now you have the takeout container that needs to go in the recycling. Then you put your recycling on the curb and then the the recycling people come and take it away. So if there's a backlog, if you're having trouble, like remember you take your recycling out, you're going to end up with this accumulation of takeout. And what your body tends to do with that is say, okay, I'm not going to order any more food then. So if you're making hormones and then those hormones are getting uh, broken down into their metabolites. And some of those metabolites may produce symptoms that we don't want more anxiety, more of the estrogen dominance kind of symptoms that we don't want more weight gain, things like that. Um, heavier periods, irritation, stuff like that. Um, your, your body's like, okay, well, there's enough of this estrogen metabolite. So let's not make new estrogen. So it can block that pathway. So you need to have, be able to clear that uh, metabolite out of your system. So your body's like, oh, okay, okay. Now we need to make fresh estrogen. We need to ramp up production. Don't know if that makes sense. A lot of stuff is kind of like complicated. So your liver needs methionine and choline, which are two ingredients found in meat and eggs to function optimally. And there are some, so we know we can make someone have fatty liver by simply depriving them of choline. So if some, so mice, if you want them to have fatty liver, all you do is take away their choline and methionine. You put them on a low choline, low methionine diet, and the mice all get fatty liver. People who are in the hospital who are receiving parental nutrition, parental nutrition is uh, like uh, IV nutrition. It's not from your parents, your, your parents, the IV, uh, if they forget to put choline, and I guess this must've happened back in the day. If choline is not in the feeding tube or in the IV nutrition, all the patients get fatty liver. And so you Whoa. can imagine they're not eating too much food, right? It's, it's literally okay. IV nutrition. So it's not an over, uh, abundance of donuts or something like that. It's just a de- de- deprivation of choline. So choline can prevent, is widely known to prevent fatty liver. Choline you find in eggs and meat um, to a lesser extent and liver. Liver is the most abundant source of choline. So meat and eggs. So that's one reason to eat eggs. Now, I don't know. This is a real quick aside, a little bit of a tangent, but how, so you can put in the chat, if you've seen some of the news stuff, it comes through my feed. It might not, it comes through my algorithms. It might not come through yours that eggs are associated with blood clots. Has anyone heard this? Eggs, like. Let me check the chat. Somebody reminded me of this because uh, when I shared the the promo of eat the damn eggs or eat the darn eggs. Yeah. <laughs> somebody was like, and now they cause blood clots. I heard like, like a joke. Um. So choline, so, okay, the eggs, blood clots, and now it's like scaring everyone. They're like, we can't eat eggs. Um, So choline in the gut can be converted into something called TMAO, right? And this is a uh, molecule that is associated with blood clots and it's associated with cardiovascular disease. Now, fish, which we know is good for your heart and good for your cardiovascular system, is the highest food in TMAO, just actually contains TMAO. And so it seems to me that TMAO is not the only factor to consider when thinking of heart disease risk, right? So in and of itself, it's probably not enough of an influence to affect your heart disease. And choline gets converted to TMAO in a a dysbiotic gut. 
So a gut that has a lot of yeast overgrowth, a lot of bad bacteria. So if you're concerned with like, so this might just be helpful to know, like, what are they talking about when they say eggs cause blood clots? Like, what the heck is that? That's the mechanism that they're afraid of. They haven't proved that eggs actually cause blood clots. All they know is that eggs cause choline. Choline can be converted to TMAO and TMAO is associated with blood clots. All right. So that's the, this is the thing a a lot. It's like cholesterol is bad because it causes heart disease. Well, maybe it causes atherosclerosis and atherosclerosis causes heart disease. Right. So we have to be careful who we're blaming. So is it the eggs or it's like the, this leap of logic that's happening. Um, and so what, if you're concerned about that, then looking at gut health is important. Um, but phosphatidylcholine is something I routinely recommend for people with a suboptimal lipid panel with uh, fatty liver for sure, gallstones for sure. And a lot of the cell membrane dysfunction, choline, phosphatidylcholine are really, really good supplements. Um, and you can get choline from liver and eggs if you want to get it from food. So we talked about this a little bit, but I, I dedicated a slide to it. So um, we're, you know, the the big question you ask is why is LDL high? If somebody is like, you know, has really high LDL, maybe it's there for a reason. And that reason could be that their body is trying to manage lipopolysaccharide produced from dysbiotic gut bacteria. So, and the type of LDL most associated with atherosclerosis, VLDL, very low density lipoprotein, um, is uh, is the type of cholesterol that gets synthesized to manage LPS. So when you have high levels of LPS in your body, your body will make more LDL and it downregulates HDL. So it's, so you end up with low HDL, high LDL. Usually people have like gut symptoms. They have a lot of inflammation. Um, I mean, you, you're probably not going to have gas and bloating, but you're going to have a, a lot of systemic symptoms that an ND could start to recognize as something's going on with your gut. Like we, we tend to think that we're going to feel like pain in our gut, or we're going to be like, like we're going to have bloating in our gut. Um, but we don't really have pain receptors in the gut. All we feel is stretch. So unless there's gas or something stretching your intestines, you're not really going to feel much. You can feel stomach pain. You can feel you can feel an inflamed stomach lining because your stomach is such an acidic environment that if your stomach lining is inflamed and can't protect you from the acid, you're going to feel that, especially maybe after or before meals or an empty stomach. But you're not really going to feel like colonic inflammation unless you're having bowel movements. Like there's only uh, specific circumstances that are going to ma- that these symptoms will manifest in. So it's good to do an assessment with an ND or somebody who's paying attention to to things and how it connects. But if you have a lot of gram-negative bacteria, so pathogenic bacteria in the gut, it is producing this endotoxin that gets absorbed into our system. And our body is trying to manage that and keep you healthy by making LDL. So this is an example of like your body is trying to help you. And then we're like, no, get out of here, fireman. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. why are you always here every time everything's on fire? Uh, So by blocking cholesterol synthesis, now you're going to have more LPS in your system. And we know that so if you inject mice with lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin, they get they get depressed, severe depression. They get inflamed. Um, and so it, it has a very negative effect on the brain and mood. And this is like part of the gut-brain connection. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so there's this like kind of old school, he's like kind of like this guru nutritionist guy called Ray Pete, and he recommends raw carrot. He has his uh, Ray Pete carrot salad. You can Google it. <laughs> It's actually pretty yummy. Uh, he likes raw carrots because he says they absorb endotoxin. It's probably true. They they have a good amount of fiber. They've uh, beta carotene. They're they're good for you. So can't hurt if you like carrots. He like shaves carrots and he throws raisins in it. And then he does like apple cider vinegar and olive oil and different things. So, you know, can't hurt. Eat a couple carrots. Um, probiotics and prebiotics. So certain probiotics are uh, can help reset the grant, the bacteria in the gut. So if someone has a lot of like, yeah, if they have a, a lot of LDL, everything else kind of looks normal. Like their cholesterol panel is a bit off and they, they, there, there's some signs of gut dysfunction. We might go, uh, you know, all disease begins in the gut. We might take a gut centered approach. And so, uh, the probiotics S. Boulardi and L. Rhamnosis, which is actually culturel, um, those are both helpful for 
reducing gram negative bacteria and they can help reduce lipopolysaccharide. You can heal the, the gut dysbiosis through herbs that kill the bad bacteria, preserve the good bacteria. You can change the diet. You can, you can do different things for gut support. There's many layers to gut health. Um, and often we start kind of basic and then we get more into it depending on how someone responds. Omega-3s are helpful. We're going to find that they're also helpful. Like we, we're, we're going to learn they're going to lower, they lower triglycerides and they moderately support HDL and LDL. Um, olive oil has polyphenols. So not only does it help with HDL, LDL, supporting cholesterol panel and optimizing it, it also helps um, manage, you know, the gut and, and support the gut. Um, polyphenols from green tea, healthy fats, lower carb diet. Um, so one of the general patterns I see is that people tend to center their diet around carbohydrates and carbohydrates are not bad for you, but when you're eating a very high carb diet and you're, and you're not like an athlete, you know, it tends to put you more in a blood sugar roller coaster. And it deprives you of being able to eat enough good fats and protein to, to, to function optimally. And maybe that's one of the reasons it's not so much that we're eating so many carbs is I don't think we're eating enough protein and fat to okay. clothe our carbs and to balance our okay. blood sugar. And so we're seeing a lot of these like blood sugar roller coasters eventually leading to metabolic dysfunction. Um, all right. Statins. <laughs> so statins are the most prescribed drug in North America. It's a, I, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. I'm going to say multi-billion dollar industry. Um, so, you know, if you're a conspiracy theorist, well, you don't need to be a conspiracy theorist. This is just capitalism. So they work by blocking HMG CoA reductase, which is an enzyme that makes cholesterol. So they literally just block cholesterol right at the source. So your liver wants to make cholesterol because it's got jobs to do. It's got to make antioxidants. It's got to build brain cells. It's got to handle these endotoxins that are being secreted into your bloodstream. And sounds like, nope, you cannot make it. We are halting this construction site. We are, you've got all these bricks, but we're not going to allow you to build a house. Um, so they come with several side effects. You can imagine, right? Because So the thing with uh, medication is that there like, you know, you could think of like a river, right? So there's many different paths to a river. And if you go way upstream and you block the river at a, cause you're like, Oh, I don't like how that river goes like Southwest and where it ends up, but it also goes East and like, you know, Southeast and it goes all these different other areas and it fills up this person's water basin. It fills up that person's well and that person's pond where they swim, but I'm just going to block it upstream at the waterfall. Now all these other downstream pathways are affected. So what you start to see with stents is you get increased insulin resistance, 70% increase. Okay. So if you're already dealing with insulin resistance, now you're on a, which is the main risk factor for heart cardiovascular disease, contributing to inflammation, influencing metabolic syndrome, probably the reason why triglycerides are high and each shell is low. Now you're going to statin and you end up with more insulin resistance or you increase your chances of getting it if you don't already have it. Rhabdomyolysis is muscle pain. This is a commonly known side effect of statins. And how is that? Why is that happening? Uh, because your mitochondria, which are your muscle is rich with, your brain is rich with, are being damaged by the statin, erectile dysfunction, similar mechanism. It's affecting blood flow. Um, so those are the most common side effects. Uh, you, you might also get cognitive dysfunction. Um, I had actually, just quick aside, I had a whole family that came to see me they cooked with uh, vegetable oil. So that was their main cooking oil. And a colleague that saw them before me told them to switch to avocado oil. So they did. And like the, the child's ADHD went away. The mother's fibroids improved and her endometriosis improved. And the husband was on a statin. His cholesterol like dropped like crazy. His LDL went to one point something and he was having brain fog rage, aggression, depression. He was having difficulty like putting words together. And so we had to like, and he was very really, like hesitant to come off the statin, right? Because someone he trusted put him on it. Um, but so it's interesting, like how effective diet can be just by improving the cooking. oil. So uh, avocado oil is a uh, MUFA, it's monounsaturated, similar to olive oil and vegetable oil is high in omega-6, highly inflammatory. Um, 
it's pushing out more inflammatory pathways and, uh, and it's increasing, like it's, it's pushing the cholesterol panel in the wrong direction. All these seed oils that we hear about, um, not the best for us. And so, yeah, diet had a miraculous effect on, on all of them because fats are so important for all these different things, for our hormones, for our brain, for our, uh, yeah, for our mood. And, um, and then, you know, the statin was just pushing them way, him way too low. So we tried to kind of, okay, half dose, still too, still way too low. Okay. Let's try coming off. Okay. Now we're, now we're great. So, um, so one of the things that statins do is deplete CoQ10, which is, uh, an antioxidant that we need for fertility, for brain health, mitochondrial function, heart muscle, uh, skeletal muscle. So a, uh, a more comprehensive MD will put you on CoQ10, tell you to take CoQ10. Um, if you're on a statin, that's, that should be best practice. That's like written into the guidelines, uh, because CoQ10 is really important for heart health and you're supposedly put on the statin to, to, uh, support heart, uh, heart health, right? Uh, it depletes fat soluble vitamins. Cause we know those come from cholesterol, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E and K. And it also depletes B vitamins, B9 and B12, also important for mitochondrial function. So it's important, you know, so what happens? Your doctor wants you on a statin, obtain your blood work, find out what the numbers are, do a little bit of research, ask your doctor what their ideal targets are. Okay. Because your doctor might be like, I don't know, just lower, just under 5.2. But remember that 5.2 under 5.2 is going to start to increase things like all cause mortality, cognitive dysfunction. And if you start to get under four millimoles per liter, now you're increasing a host of mental health issues. So keep that in mind. Um, you could, you know, print out some studies and uh, tell them about that. So just to be clear, though, you're not telling people who are on statins to just like stop taking their statins tomorrow. Right? No, because you need to be monitoring your levels. So you need to know yes. like what you're starting And you need to be working point. with someone, right, making yeah. sure that you are dealing with the underlying conditions of what's actually going on. Yeah. So go to, you know, go to someone, work with somebody who's willing to like help you. Um, now, some people are like, it's too low. So I never take people, I, I don't have the... Uh, I don't have the prescribing power to prescribe a sentence. So I can't wean you, which means like prescribe a half dose or something like that. And I can't take you off it. It's not my scope of practice. So what I usually will say is like cholesterol panel will come through. It can be frustrating because there's a, it's like, you know, one of us speaking Greek, one of us speaking Italian. So um, their cholesterol panels coming Their Their total cholesterol is 3.5. Okay. So I'm like, okay, well, yeah, you're experiencing a lot of mental health issues. You're, you've got low mood. You're, you've got brain fog. Your cholesterol is way too low. Like, oh yeah, yeah. I've always had a high cholesterol. My doctor told me. So sometimes I give them like a little bit of a script to help. Like, okay, well, tell your doctor that you've been working on your diet and lifestyle. There's also a part of it is like, how do you bridge the communication gap, right? Like, what your doctor wants you to be healthy. They also want to um, be a responsible practitioner too, right? They, it's not like they're. <laughs> out to get you. So yeah, if you use the language, they understand it's just knowing, like, if you're like, I'm seeing a naturopath and we're doing like breathing exercises, they're going to be like, mm. but if you're like, well, I've been working on my health, my diet and exercise. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that I would like to come off of my statin and then they might say, okay, let's do a half dose. Let's do none. It's, it's always up to you. Right. Mm -hmm. But I would do this guided and, it is good to have a team rather than this idea of like second opinion, right? Is have a team of people. People are going to be looking at, at your case, your health from different angles. There may be like, you know, you're ultimately in the driver's seat. So there might be like two differing opinions coming at you. It would, you know, who do you trust? Well, yourself. <laughs> How do you develop that trust? you know, taking in the information, weighing it. And a, a lot of this, right, is this like idea of uh, being responsible. Responsible doesn't mean like for your own health. It doesn't mean like you're the only one, you're on your own. It just means like, ultimately, we are the ones that are going to deal with the consequences of our health, right? Your doctor's not going to get muscle pain if you're on a statin. So, being like aware of things, asking questions. Sometimes we don't know the questions to ask. So I can help patients with that, right? Like what, what are the targets you want to see? Like, okay, so you say my cholesterol is high. Well, what's my 10 year Framingham risk? And your doctor might be like, whoa, she knows about that. Okay. Sometimes just like knowing, 
Like if I say, when I say doctor, I never say I'm a naturopath, but I will just like ask those kind of questions and you get a great response and it, it helps. It really helps to navigate the healthcare system when you just have, when you, when you kind of understand what the practitioner's thinking, what their thought process is. The, the problem, right, in, in our system is that we don't always, so I try and share my thought process with, with patients, but we have enough time for that. Whereas if you have a 15 minute, uh, you know, a visit with an MD, they don't always have that time. But if you know the questions to get to, if you, if you have like the list in front of you, you, you can have a much better conversation, you know, right. and, you know, your doctor wants you to be successful. They want you to be healthy. They want you to understand you know, the risks of not taking something, they want you to be aware and they want you to be informed. Like no doctor wants a patient that's just like, like doesn't understand what's going on. So if you ask the right questions, you're more likely for them to be like, okay, you know, you, you started exercising and you started eating well, (laughs) these big things. And, uh, okay. So maybe let's try and decrease your statin and, and you might bring the nature study in and be like, Hey, I just read this and saw that, you know, that under 5.1 is associated with all increase all cause mortality. Tell me about this doctor. And mm-hmm. they might be like, I've never seen this before. Or, oh, that's interesting. So it's just it's just creating a conversation, asking questions, you know. It's hard. It's not easy. You often need guidance. Like when I I, I broke my foot um and I was like waiting an hour and a half for to see the orthopedic surgeon. And I'd like forget the question like, can I drive? Right. Like I'd forget the question. So it's good to have them written down, be prepared. Um, and this is how we kind of advocate for our is it, patient advocacy, a big word now in the, in the healthcare system, we know our healthcare system is really overloaded these days. So the more patients are able to advocate, the better able you are to get good care and the better able you are to, to be heard, right. And to have your needs met. We shouldn't always assume that those needs are just going to be met for us. Right. Um, unfortunately it's, it's sad, but yeah. Um, so yeah, never just come off, start the conversation and, and know that it is ultimately your choice, but it's good to do it informed, you know? Um, so what do we do? What would I do? Someone's like, so a lot of the time, uh, people will come to me early. It's the best time to come. Not, you know, it's like, oh, my doctor said I have high cholesterol. Okay. And then they say, okay, let me think about it. And then they may book in with me. Maybe they already see me. And so what we're looking at is like the individual, right? We're not treating your labs. We're treating you. So is there insulin resistance? Is there metabolic syndrome? That we got to prioritize. How's your liver functioning? Is there inflammation? Is your blood viscous? So this is one thing I didn't add is that atherosclerosis is far more likely to manifest in someone with inflammation and viscous blood. So like thicker blood. So you might have, so if you have certain levels, like they're at the bottom, CRP, SR, fibrinogen, if those are elevated in your blood, it's showing that your blood's more viscous, then it's more, then elevated cholesterol is more of a concern, right? If you have, there's little evidence that high cholesterol in the absence of inflammation is a problem. But if you have a lot of, and then what they think that statins do to prevent heart, a second heart attack. So statins are the best at preventing a second heart attack, not your first one. If you've already had a heart attack, then they reduce your chances of getting a second by 33%, actually about 1% if your chances are three. I know there's a lot, there's a kind of confusing the way I said that, but you can think of it as like statins are best for secondary prevention. If you, but one of the, the proposed mechanisms is not that they're lowering cholesterol, it's that they're lowering inflammation. So inflammation may be the more important thing to focus on. And, uh, and so, you know, and what inflammation does is kind of lowers blood visc inflammation raises the viscosity of your blood makes it more likely to clot. We, we care about gut health. So we want to make sure that you're not producing tons of endotoxin that your body is trying to manufacture LDL and BLDL to manage and relevant tests are fasting insulin, fasting glucose, HbA1c, which looks at your glucose control over time. This is a common test. It's probably tested every time you get a physical. CRP, ESR, and fibrinogen, these test inflammatory levels, blood viscosity, and the liver enzymes, AST, ALT, ALP, GGT. So this is like a liver panel. It looks like, you know, that the, that should be uh, not lighting up at all. So the liver panel should be like quiet, no abnormal findings. If you have elevated liver enzymes, that's showing that your liver is under distress. 
And so we said treat the individual. One another of our uh, natural ethic principles is treat the cause. Similar idea. So we want to like with treat the individual, we want to get to the bottom of it. Like what other factors? How's your gut? How, what other lab markers are are showing up? What other things do we need to test? What more information do we need? Treat the cause is. Well, we actually need cholesterol for hormone function, brain function, antioxidants, soaking up endotoxin. So, you know, how do we support your body's needs and reduce your risk of heart attack and stroke and support your cardiovascular health? And so we want to reduce inflammation. That's a big one. What is causing the inflammation, right? What is actually setting the house on fire, right? And and that's why the firemen are there. So if you want to get rid of the firemen, we got to, we got to, put it, help them put out the fire, um, or like whatever, turn the gas stove off or whatever's like keeping the fire going. Um, we want to look at nutrient deficiencies, increase HDL it can be done through omega-3 magnesium, vitamin D. Those are all important. Um, support insulin sensitivity, make sure that your, your insulin signaling is, is optimized, um, and treat the gut. Look at dysbiosis, look at fatty liver make sure the liver's functioning optimally. And some of the, some of the uh, things you might get are, these are some evidence-based theories. A treatment plan never looks like this. It's never just like slap, slap, slap. It's like very specific. I don't just tell you to go exercise. Like we talk about it and mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. And just, <laughs> I was just going to say, that. and then you don't do it, but <laughs> we, <laughs> and just but we, to- yeah, in I terms mean, of what? the exercise, yeah. they've, you know, quite a few of the Reshape Method members have said that, you know, they've come back from their doctor and their doctor's like, well, what are you doing? Your cholesterol's come down. So, yeah, yeah. It, it's massively powerful. And your doctor will accept that that works. So, it is like it's solid in the research that exercise helps. It lowers LDL and it raises HDL. So, it does whatever it keeps Any your exercise? Happy. Any exercise or yeah. specific kinds at this point? Any exercise. Any exercise. Yeah. Most of the research is on aerobic exercise. It's the easiest to study. So you're, you're always going to see research on like 30 minutes of walking a day. Yes. And that's great. Right. Do it. And yeah. there's more research now on strength training, which I think everyone should do at mm-hmm. least a couple times a week, some weight bearing exercise. So either your body weight, mm-hmm. like Tracy's program, gets the process started. You start with your body weight, you start to add a load. The nice thing about strength training, I gave this spiel to a patient yesterday is trying to sell her. <laughs> I was like, it doesn't take, it never takes more time. Like 20 minutes is, is good. And what you do is when that gets too easy, you just add more weight. Right. Yeah. So you net, so like if you're, if your one hour run is easy, you got to keep running more. Right. But um, if your weightlifting exercise is easy, you just add more weight. So you're always loading and you're always increasing. And it has a ma- massive benefit to mood and builds muscle. That's gonna that, that's probably the most powerful thing you can do to yeah. get your insulin levels down. But the magic drug, the best medicine on earth for managing your insulin and your glucose levels is after every meal, go for us, uh, move your muscles. Yeah. Go for a, it doesn't have to be a long walk. You don't need to go for an hour, literally five minutes of moving your muscles after you eat will lower your glucose by 30%. Like not even an insulin injection will do that. Yeah. Say that again, shout that from the mountaintops. So five minutes of yeah. walking, whatever, getting up to mm-hmm. load your dishwasher, just do it in like a very flamboyant way that will lower your glucose by 30%. Yeah. And that's the magic because I'm showing people how to get a lot more natural movement and walking into their day in the reshape method because we tend to overlook the simple things. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's very simple and it's massive. I've seen people Mm -hmm. with continuous glucose monitors. It's like, it's like, like, what did you do? Did your doctor put you on a new medication? No, I just did what you said, the walking thing. Five minutes after meals, eat breakfast, get up, do like a shimmy shake five minutes, go for a walk after lunch go for a walk with your partner or your dog or whoever after dinner and you're good to go. And so that's like massive. That's a, has a huge impact, probably more than like very like massive diet, like diet changes are important, but you probably get further with the walking thing. Um, and why, what's the reason for that? So you're, uh, you're, you're what insulin's job is 
doing, what, what his job is, is to get glucose into your cells. Okay. So your like, I don't know, liver needs insulin to get uh, glucose in. So a- any of the cells in your body, your glucose level goes up. The cells need insulin to get, to get glucose in so that they can use the glucose for energy. And your body also wants your glucose levels down. It doesn't want high glucose. That's toxic to your body. That's why diabetes is a problem because now your glucose levels have gone up. Your body can't control it. And it's becoming, it's, it's increasing blood viscosity and that's increasing your risk of all kinds of different health conditions. High insulin is also a bad thing. It's also increases inflammation. It causes your, it, it, basically you're never in a fasted state. Your body's always acting as if it just got fed. So it's always telling your body to store fat. So your muscles though, don't need insulin to soak glucose. So when you eat a meal, your glucose levels are going to go up. But if you move your muscles, it's like a sponge that sucks the glucose up, clears it out of your system without needing the subsequent insulin release. Mm -hmm. So you get this 30% reduction in your fasting glucose and you're not getting this big insulin spike. And so over time, like what, what we're trying to do with insulin resistance is we're trying to reduce the load or the need for insulin. We're trying to get your, your insulin to stop needing to spike to manage your glucose. So your insulin is managing your glucose currently. If you don't have diabetes, like if your blood sugar is normal, but you have insulin resistance, your blood sugar, it's being compensated for, but with insulin. So you've got high insulin managing your blood sugar. And so what we want is to like, okay, insulin, you take a day off. We don't need you anymore. So the the more you can prevent your sugar from spiking, less insulin you need, the more you can blunt glucose, um, the glucose curve. So moving your muscles, there's certain ways you can eat. So eating a plate of vegetables before meals, eating your protein, your veggies first, then your protein and fat, then your carbs after carb reduction. (laughs) No one wants to hear that. (laughs) Reducing. That's a fast way to do it is you do like Uh a lower carb diet, uh, taking out sugar. So like you're, you're blunting your, um, the glucose spikes, you're not requiring insulin release. And then over time, your body starts to become more sensitive to insulin again. Yeah. So one of the fast ways you can do is just move your body and then you can eat, yeah. you know, you eat your pie and you're like, okay, now I just got to dance it out <laughs> and, or go for a walk Yeah, uh, within 15 minutes of your meal. Um, so I, that. I okay. started doing that now we, and we have a treadmill in the basement because it's pretty um, I see outside and dark and like way too cold after dinner, I just go down to the basement and I walk on my treadmill for 15 minutes. Yeah. And like I just like that. Just move your muscles. Yeah. Move yeah. your muscles. And actually the mm-hmm. soleus, which Tracy, you, you know yes. all about the soleus yeah. is one of the best muscles for soaking up glucose. Yes. Interestingly enough. So if you do yeah. your calf exercises on Tracy's, uh-huh. uh, program, you do your like calf raises. Yeah five minutes of those, you'll have like strong calves. Your apple pie is absorbed. 30% yeah. of it's absorbed. You're good to go. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and so, and there might be something. So, and the yeah. bigger your muscle, the more metabolically active your muscles, right. the better they are at doing this. Right. So yeah. if your muscles are like, if you don't have access to your soleus, if you don't know how to mm-hmm. like, if your calves aren't strong, you won't get as much of an effect. So the more you right. build muscle, the more you move your muscles. Right. And that's why the whole idea of my approach is progressive, right? We start by just improving the alignment and then you start adding load, right? Yeah. Which is what you were saying. You can always just stay at 20 minutes, but you just increase the weights. That's and right. I just turned 53 and I've got this little um, collection of dumbbells that I'm getting. If every birthday I'm <laughs> asking for um, a heavier dumbbell. So I started off at 30 and then 40. And this year I asked for 50 and I just do a couple of deadlifts, mm-hmm. like 10, 10 deadlifts with the dumbbells, like a couple of times a day. And the difference in whole body muscle strength is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. And glute. And then you get like the, the like squat bum, the yes. <laughs> like nice bum. <laughs> squat bum. Yeah. It's the thing is 10. So you get a 50, if that's your weight, 50 pounds. So whatever, like, you know, 10 to 12 reps and you feel, you feel like tired by the end, you know, you feel like, okay, I probably can't do 15. Like I'm good at 12. I'm kind of maxed out. You do, you take a break. Mm -hmm. You're ready to go again. You do it like three times, you know, three sets and that you're, you're good. That's it. So maybe you do like three different exercises, like deadlifts, squats, lunges for the lower body, 
I don't yeah. know, shoulder press, bicep curls, tricep overhead things yeah. for the upper body. You do some ab, like you can, you can alternate it. So like one day is one, one is the next, or you do a full body twice a week. Like it's a lot less than what people think, right? Yeah. People are like, I go and to the gym I, for an hour. It's like, yeah. You, and you, I think people are really also, hurt. there are, for some reason, I know I was certainly like this before I started doing this work. They, we were afraid to increase the load. I don't know if we think we're going to bulk up, but what I'm really encouraging people to do is like, especially women, like you've got to move on from the pink dumbbells. They are not serving you, the pink ones, yeah. right? Yeah. And they're definitely not serving your cholesterol either. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Start lifting heavier weights. And uh, and this will be, this will, I, I have like a whole email I sent people about how maybe, you know, insulin resistance, and this, there's a lot of theories on this, insulin resistance may be caused by a lack of muscle. Our body's not able to compensate manage glucose anymore because it just doesn't have wow. enough of a muscle sponge. And that's the first place insulin resistance tends to occur is in the muscle. So mm-hmm. low protein diets, high stress, not you know, too much cardio, which is breaking down your muscle, yeah. too, you know, stress again, breaks down your muscle. Mm-hmm. So all these things, all these patterns, and the, it's the thing, it's not one thing, usually it's a pattern over right. time. And then, so all we have to do is like, understand what are those specific patterns and reshift. This is why here's a rant, everyone. This is why I'm, uh, I'm like, okay, it's, we hear diet exercise. We're like, okay, that means like a treadmill and which I'm not talking about your treadmill thing. I'm talking about like the 45 minutes on the elliptical. So like steady state cardio and low calorie diet. I'm going to track my calories. Go, But that is not the uh, target. Like that's not the answer, right? So that's not the, the right. That's not the problem. Wasn't the calories and the problem wasn't the lack of like just steady state cardio, right? It wasn't calories mm-hmm. that was the issue. It was the lack of muscle, the lack of protein, the the uh, stress. So you're, you know, the low calorie diet is, it's like not an incomplete solution. We haven't, we haven't gotten the right solution. We're, we're imposing now some kind of stressful limitation and a, and a way that we're looking at our food now. And it's not the targeted specific approach, which is Forget about calories, raise your protein, first of all, and see what happens. Start building muscle, start moving every day. Okay, let's see what happens. Start managing your stress. So it's like, this is the more targeted. So this is what I mean by it. it's not, it, it, it's not like it's easy, but it's not the like, oh my God. And a lot of the time we're burnt out by the idea of diet and exercise because we tried that approach, didn't right. really work, wasn't sustainable, mm-hmm. and it was very stressful. And it worsened some of the components of the pattern that were at play. Mm -hmm. So this is the, this is a problem, right? So people are like, I'm on a low calorie diet. I'm like, okay, but that's not, that's just taking the, the imbalance ratio of macronutrient and you're just now decreasing the amount, right? So you're, you're decreasing your carbs, but you're still mostly eating carbs. And so and your body, that's just stress. It's like yeah. your body just doesn't, your body's not like, woohoo, we're getting healthy. It's like, we're stressed, we're dying, yes. we're starving. And now we're having to And then we the add trend. the stress of the stressful yeah. exercise <laughs> yeah. on top of it, right? And I so love what like, Dr. Yeah. Lyon says. She's the muscle-centric doctor, right? She's like, oh, yeah. you're not overweight, you're under-muscled. Yeah. Yeah. You're under-muscled. And there's another rant or another aside, I guess, is that when you have high insulin and when you are when you weigh more, so two things that you, you don't want, you're actually in a very good place to reverse the pattern. Like there's almost an advantage there because when you have a lot of circulating insulin, insulin puts muscle on your body. So when you do a weightlifting exercise, if you have fast, like baseline high fasting insulin, you're going to put on muscle so much faster than your skinny friend who's like doing beach body every day. I know this because my friend who's like always like 110 pounds, she's like, yeah, I'm doing this workout. I'm putting on a, they're telling me a pound of muscle a month is a good target. Right. So that's kind of wild. Um, Whereas I can put on a lot faster (laughs) than that. And uh, I was doing this yoga, uh, like a 50 minute yoga. I was dying at the end. And the yoga teacher is probably like 80 pounds soaking wet. She's like super easy for her. And I'm like, but it's hard for me because it's like, I'm doing this with like that, your new birthday kettlebell, you know? (laughs) (laughs) So I'm like, it's like I'm holding the kettlebell to him. So you're actually in a better, like you're going to build muscle. It's a more effective workout. Um, So I'll just quickly, 
uh, I have to bring my dog to the vet in a, in a minute. <laughs> um, so fish oil, we talked about this. It reduces triglycerides. The main thing it does, it lowers blood viscosity, lowers inflammation, good for the brain. Um, you want high dose fish oil. Most people don't dose high enough. So two to four grams a day, total omega threes, and then about a gram of EPA a day. Phosphatidylcholine, I, I'll recommend quite a bit for increasing choline helps shift the cholesterol. Uh, ratio. It helps with brain health. It helps reduce fatty liver or it prevents fatty liver, certainly supports gallbladder function and uh, it supports gut health. It helps with concentration because it makes acetylcholine and, um, and it's also helping to move cholesterol into bile uh, acid synthesis. And interestingly, so there's something called the number needed to treat NNT it's like, how many people do you need to treat to get one uh, person who like to prevent one heart attack? Okay. So if I give, so everyone thinks like, if you take this drug, everyone's going to have a, no, it's you, you look at the NNT. So if you give 217 people a statin, you prevent one heart attack. Okay. But 210 people. Okay. So, but if you give 61 people the Mediterranean diet, you prevent a heart attack. So oh. let that sink in. I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Mediterranean diet is high olive oil, fruits, vegetables, you know, protein, whole grains, like a health, the healthy diet. All right. right. Um, yeah. Good fats, avocado. And um, all right. So NNT for, number needed to treat 61 people to prevent a heart attack. If you put them all in the Mediterranean diet, and, but if you put 270 people on statins, only one, you'll prevent one heart attack, but the number needed to harm. So there's none for the Mediterranean diet because the only harm is like, uh, well, I don't know. It's not that restrictive. Like you still get wine, you know, but the number needed to harm for statins are 210. Uh, so 210 people get a statin. Um, and then you, um, and then one person will get diabetes. Right. Right. So of those 210 okay. people, if you give 207 and 10 people a statin, you'll prevent one heart attack and one person will get diabetes. Mm -hmm. And if you give 21 people a statin, one person will have muscle damage. Mm -hmm. All right. So those of those 217 people you're getting, what is it? Right. 10 cases of muscle damage. Um, all right. That's all I need to say. <laughs> My wow. <name> That's, <laughs> That's it. Thank Welcome you. Thank you rant. so, so much for, for this information, because it really, it's, it's empowerment, right? And I love, you know, that, that, that everybody can go through this over and over again and look at, like Tal Dr. Talia has given us so much detail that you can look through your reports, your tests and get a better understanding of what's going on. So as, as Dr. Talia said, you can go to your doctor and start to ask the questions, mm -hmm. right? And be in a little bit more empowered and know that there are options if you're prepared mm -hmm. to not just, that the statin is not the panacea, right? There is yeah. no thing as a magic bullet, right? There's yeah. no magic wand. If you are prepared to do the work to take charge of your health and charge of your change, do the right kind of exercise, eat the right kind of food. And it's really, it's not very hard. It really isn't as complex as people make it out to be, right? And if you've done the diet and you've done the exercise and it, it hasn't worked for you, then come and speak to me. I'll tell you about the reshape method because what we do is like not diet and not exercise like anything, you know it. Mm -hmm. So thank you so, so much for coming to talk to us. It's been incredible. If you have any questions, please just pop them um, pop them in the comments and Dr. Talia will, will, will come into the moving and reshaping for women over 40 Facebook group and answer them for us. I'm sure. Um, thank you. Just such, such important information. Thank you, Tracy. This is great. Thanks. Everyone. Amazing. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.